presents Hancock and Kelly. Welcome to Hancock and Kelly here on Fox 2 live on your Sunday morning. Good morning, gentlemen. On the right is John Hancock. Good morning. Good morning. Top of the morning. Yes, good to see you. And on the left is Michael Kelly. Hey, Michael. Good morning. And I'm John Brown. Fresh off vacation, fellas. I'm ready to go. And I got a bit of a tan, too. Lots of golf. All right, let's set the table here with a wrap up of the big political stories over the past few days, and then we shall debate and discuss. President Trump began a busy day of campaigning with a seniors event in Fort Myers, telling them he is living proof that with new therapeutics, a senior citizen can beat the coronavirus. We've reached the point where the fatality rate is reduced by 85% since April, and now it's up to probably 91%. Well, I'm here, I'll tell you. The president again promising to fast track vaccines and medicines like the antibody cocktail he swears all but cured him. I wasn't feeling great. And the next day I wake up and I'm saying like, uh, who can I fight today? <laughs> There may have been no one to fight today, but last night saw an adversarial town hall in Miami. The president again pressed whether he will accept a peaceful transition of power should he lose the election. They spied on my campaign and they got caught, and they spied heavily on my campaign, and they tried to take down a duly elected city president, and then they talk about, will you accept a peaceful transfer? And the answer is yes, I will. But I want it to be an honest election, and so does everybody else. President Trump also dismissing any national security implications of his business loan burden, said in a New York Times article to be around $400 million. Are you confirming that, yes, you do owe some $400 million? What I'm saying is that it's a tiny percentage of my net worth. Democrats have raised questions whether any of that debt is held by foreign entities like Russia. But the New York Times itself found the debt still held by the issuer, Deutsche Bank. While the president's Fort Myers event was about seniors, he also waded into attacks against Joe Biden, again hammering the business deals Biden's son Hunter was involved in and what the former vice president might have known about them. I'll tell you what, it's an organized crime family as far as I'm concerned. President Trump also lashing out against Twitter for censoring links to a New York Post article about newly discovered emails allegedly involving Hunter Biden's business contacts and criticizing ABC's George Stephanopoulos for not asking Joe Biden about it in last night's ABC News town hall. This is the hottest subject there is. They didn't ask him one question about their corruption in the family. They didn't ask him one question about how big tech is protecting him. All right, so again, that was John Roberts, and that came down on Friday night, but wrapped up everything from this wild week. Michael, you're up first. Let's talk about the dueling town halls. What did you see and what did you take away? Well, we saw one adult that had an opportunity to sit and discuss issues, talk about a plan on how they would deal with coronavirus, how they would run the presidency if they were lucky enough to win the White House. And another person who acted childish continues to be combative doesn't really even understand his own record and wants to throw out sound bites to put people off the trail rather than discuss the fact that we have a virus that's killed over 200,000 of us. John. Well, Donald Trump plays offense. That's his game. It's been his game, not just for the last five years, but the last 50 years. Uh, so it's no surprise that he was doing that again uh, at the town hall meeting. You know, Biden was pressed on whether he was going to pack the Supreme Court and wouldn't give an answer. So, um, you know, I don't know that that town hall moved any minds, changed any opinions. I think it was kind of a wash. Yeah, we're going to get to that uh, Joe Biden soundbite coming up in our second block of the show today. But, you know, Savannah Guthrie, John, did bring up some interesting issues about, you know, is your business debt being held elsewhere? Is this business debt a big deal? So it seems like in that format, we actually did get some some discussions and not a bunch of yelling this time. Well, the president seemed to confirm that he did have debt of over $400 million. And, um, you know, that's a lot of debt. Now, he made the point that as a percentage of his net worth, it really wasn't that big. But $400 million of debt is, is real debt. Uh, and a lot of it, a good deal of it, is coming due in the next year or two. Uh, so it's a it's a legitimate issue to discuss on the campaign trail. You know, Michael, I'm curious, too, because he called Biden's family an organized crime family. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that one? 
Well, it's projection. Uh, look, uh, Donald Trump's a one-trick pony. He just throws out insults. He projects what is himself on others. People are tired of it. We want to discuss issues. We've got real concerns. They're moving forward a Supreme Court nomination to take away health care. They promised that they were going to repeal and replace. They've done none of this. He's a one-trick pony. He doesn't understand issues. And he just wants to throw people ridiculousness. You know, John, one thing that was brought up to me, which, which I think is a pretty good point, is the president seems to be in these... You said he's on offense, but he's playing defense on a lot of the stuff, that, the controversies. But he doesn't talk much about his successes, and he has had a lot of successes with foreign policy. The economy is going well. Why do you think it is that he won't bring those kind of things up and keep the focus on the things he actually has accomplished? Because that worked great for Obama uh, eight years ago, whatever it would be at this point, going into his second term. Well, I think he does. Uh, but when he gets in an interview format, all too often the interviewer is not asking him questions about it the economy and uh, allowing him the opportunity to extol the good things that he has brought to the country. And I think that's part of the problem. Uh, Biden, for the most part, the other night was served up a bunch of softballs and the president had, you know, Savannah got three in his face the whole time. So I think when he has the opportunity to talk about his record, he does. And I think it's effective for him. Okay, Michael, we also got to look ahead at the big topics for the next and final debate coming up this week, right? If they have it, they say they are, we'll see. Okay, they are fighting COVID-19, American families, race in America, climate change, national security, and leadership. So uh, you guys are convinced that there aren't a bunch of moderates out there. Why even have this final debate if you're Joe Biden and you're that far up, Michael? Well, if you're Joe Biden, it's another chance to show people that you're competent and you have a plan. And more importantly, to put a spotlight on an unhinged individual who shouldn't even be in the White House. Um, look, the president's the one who needs this debate. If there are any undecideds, and I agree with you, John Brown, I don't think there are. Um, Donald Trump needs to be out there talking to those voters. Uh, that's not his personality. That's not what I expect him to do. And I think any debate forum that includes the both of them will only continue to benefit Joe Biden. John, so I hear this week a lot of Republican insiders advising the president to just let Joe Biden talk. Don't interrupt him. His answers sometimes get him in trouble. Um, so can the president just be quiet and let Joe Biden more or less go out on his own and, and make mistakes here? Well, I think that would be a sound approach uh, because, you know, Biden, he starts wandering down the field sometimes and you know, not, not sure where the ball's going. And, and I do think if the president would give some air in there for Biden to talk, uh, that's probably the better strategy than, than constantly interrupting uh, kind of the way that, yeah, I think the first debate did not go well for Donald Trump. And he's got an opportunity to reset here. I hope he does it. All right, still to come here on Hancock and Kelly, President Trump also talked about the pandemic stimulus plan. President now saying he's going to go for what? $1.8 trillion. So will we see stimulus checks? Who's against him? Who's for him? We'll talk about that one coming up right here on Hancock and Kelly. The best things in life are free, but you can get them to the birds and bees. I need fun. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I want.
To hear more, listen to the podcast. Just search for Hancock and Kelly. And welcome back to Hancock and Kelly. Let's talk about the U.S. Supreme Court, the vote that might be coming up very soon. I'm going to start with this one. Joe Biden asked several questions about if he will expand the Supreme Court if he gets into the president's office. Uh, still not answering. Okay, here's his answer in the question to George, from George Stephanopoulos. It won't be about what's going on now, the improper way they're proceeding. But don't voters have a right to know where you they stand? They do have a right to know where I stand, and I'll have a right to know where I stand before they vote. So you'll come out with a clear position before Election Day? Yes, depending on how they handle this. You know, Michael, that's the one that seems to be getting Democrats concerned. He won't answer a question like that, and it does seem to play with a lot of people. Your thoughts on his answer there? I think his answer is fine. And if you go with the new way the Republicans have operated for the past four years, it doesn't really matter what they say. Uh, so I think Joe Biden will come out. He will say his position. He'll tell the truth. And the Republicans are going to have some consequences for pushing through this nomination the way they have and uh, going back on their hypocrisy of just a couple of short years ago. You know, John, it's that particular soundbite that got my attention talking about our previous topic of the president just standing down, letting Joe Biden answer or not answer questions. That's an example of what they're saying. Let him let him try and answer. If he doesn't have a good answer, it's going to hurt him. Well, and, and this issue in particular, if you allow one side, look, big tech is freezing up my wireless over here. If you allow one side uh, to add to the court, you know, someday the shoe will be on the other foot and you're going to end up with a Supreme Court of 15, 20, 30 people. That is not good for our system of government. I hope Biden comes out against packing the court. By the way, let me address an issue very quickly. I got a text. Yes, we know John Hancock's video is freezing up on occasion. It's everybody out in his neighborhood getting online to watch Hancock and Kelly live on their computer this morning. So, yes, we know it. But we get to see your face, John. All right, let's talk about another pandemic stimulus bill. I'm not for sure who'd even believe at this point or if it's all just posturing. President Trump said on Thursday he's ready to sign that fourth coronavirus stimulus package. He also says that if he and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi strike a deal, Senate Republicans will get on board. But how much will it be? What will it cover? Now, we could go into the specifics here, John Hancock, but we don't know any specifics. They're just throwing out these dollar amounts like, oh, you want 1.5 trillion? Okay, I'll go 1.8 trillion. What's going to be in it? I don't know. John, as a fiscal conservative, which you are, this is fun, funny, phony money right now because no one's saying where the money's going to. Well, and we don't have it. Uh, you know, this is the first time in 70 years that our budget deficit is going to be larger than the gross domestic product of the United States. You know, there comes a point where you just can't spend money anymore. Do we need to address stimulus? Yes. But we need to do it in a fiscally as fiscally responsible way as possible. I'm very concerned about the amount of spending. And it's both parties. Both parties are spending irresponsibly. You know, Michael, we had a, a viewer question uh, that we may get to in just a bit. But they said, come on, they must think the American people are stupid because you're just throwing out numbers now that don't mean anything. Trump says no deal. Nancy Pelosi says $1.5 trillion. Then Trump says $1.8 trillion. I, no one even believes these negotiations are taking place. So I don't know what they think of us to think that we should be buying into this. Well, we do have a benchmark of where the Democrats stand. Unfortunately, we have a Republican Party that's schizophrenic and out of their doggone mind. You have a president who one day says, no stimulus, we're waiting until after the election. Then saying, well, what the Republicans agree to something. Now saying, my Senate's going to come along. Has he been paying attention to what's going on with this Senate? They're not behind him anymore. He's lost his own senators. They're afraid of being tied to Donald Trump. There's nobody in charge of the Republican Party. Nancy Pelosi's left to negotiate with herself. Pass the bill. Uh, you know, do you think we need to see one, Michael? Should there be a stimulus bill passed? I mean, you think about yes. this. I mean, before the election. How about that? Before the election, because the people won't get the money before then. So I don't know the push to try and get it done and get the money in the, it's not going to happen that quick, I don't think. Well, if we can push through a Supreme Court justice that we had said previously should wait till the net, till after the voters have spoken, we can't do something when 10% of us are unemployed, when an economy shut down, when a third of the restaurants in my neighborhood are gone, people are suffering. This president's more focused on taking away health care than he is bringing this economy back. Okay, John, that's interesting. That just brought up an interesting point. You guys think there are not a lot of whole, a whole lot of undecideds out there. If the economy's not going to change, if the Supreme Court, we already know where that's going, what, what would be something that's still hanging out there that might get people to move their vote? 
Well, I think you're just going to have to see these two candidates side by side at the debate. I think that could have a profound effect. The other thing, too, the polls in Pennsylvania are tightening up, and that's a big deal. Uh, it's such a big deal that the Democrats are sending Barack Obama to Pennsylvania this week. Uh, they're playing their biggest card, telling me that they think they've got a problem there. And uh, if they've got issues in Pennsylvania, all of a sudden this race for the electoral votes becomes a lot closer. All right, Michael, you can follow up on that one very quickly. And then yeah, we'll go to break. Great argument. But the Republicans are in trouble everywhere, including red states of Texas, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. Yeah, Barack Obama's going to Pennsylvania. You don't have enough surrogates to go out there and try to cover the flanks for the, for the president in the red states that he's losing. All right, still to come here on Hancock and Kelly. We're doing viewer questions today, which means... The production crew gets to play the B-roll of people typing. Look at that. We have questions about the stimulus, if Hunter Biden is actually a story this election. We've got a lot of questions coming up for the fellas. Welcome back to Hancock and Kelly. We get tons of emails and messages every week, so we haven't done this one in a while, guys. I hope you're ready. Let's go through some viewer emails and comments. All right, this one first. I think, John Hancock, you can handle this one first. What happens if there is a bloodbath in the Senate like so many political insiders think there will be? What happens to the Republican Party after that? Signed by Samantha, a Republican living in Dogtown. <laughs> I think she pointed that out. Maybe she's the only one. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Uh, well, John, what happens if, if there is a bloodbath, and if there's not, then somebody's going to show this segment and say, you guys jumped the gun. What happens to the Republican Party? Well, I'm glad to see there are Republicans living in Dogtown. That's good. <laughs> one. Uh, you know, it's interesting. If you look at the future of the Republican Party, uh, it's almost personified by two young Republican senators. You've got our own Josh Hawley. Uh, who's really kind of taken that populist mantle and is running with it and has become uh, very prominent in that area. And then you've got just to the north of us, a young Republican Senator, Ben Sass, 
who excoriated Donald Trump this week, uh, says I'm more of a, a traditional movement conservative. Two young senators, both ambitious. I think, in a, in a very real sense, the future direction of the Republican Party is going to be decided right through the heart of Missouri and Nebraska. Hmm. And the Democrats, they've got to reckon with their future as well. Are they going to nominate people like Joe Biden? Or, or is their future more in the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, AOC world? We shall see. All right, Michael, you're up on that one. Oh, I think both parties have got some issues to deal with after this election, but the Republican Party has to decide whether or not it's going to continue to be their party of Donald Trump. All the conservative principles, which John Hancock has spent his whole life fighting for, have been out the window with this president. There are a lot of Republicans who are disenfranchised. They have an important voice that needs to be heard, and unfortunately, it doesn't have a voice right now in the Republican Party. All right, let's go to our next viewer question here today. It reads, you guys haven't talked about Hunter Biden. Do you not think that's a story? That one's Suzanne from Chesterfield. Uh, Michael Kelly, Hunter Biden issues. Is that a story? Well, sure, it's a story. It's been discussed. It's been talked about. This goes down the whole Donald Trump rabbit hole. I mean, doesn't this seem really familiar to what happened in 2016? No talk about issues. Get you to chase a shiny object, something that doesn't have any credibility behind it. The, all the information on, Donald, uh, on Hunter Biden has been dug up by Rudy Giuliani. Lots of people think that's been done with foreign adversaries in the midst of all this stuff. Don't forget, Hunter Biden and investigating Hunter Biden is what got Donald Trump impeached. If I were advising the Republicans, I'd talk about the issues. They have a story to tell. Quit throwing out shiny objects. You know, uh, John, same thing. Rudy Giuliani apparently says, oh, I've got even some naked pictures of Hunter Biden. I'm like, well, who cares? He's not on the ticket. There are issues out there that I think need to be looked into with him. But when you throw out the naked pictures of somebody not even running, that to me kind of loses it. What are your thoughts on Hunter Biden here? Well, first of all, he should never have gone to work for Burisma while his father was the sitting vice president. That is an ethical violation. It was a bad decision. Now, uh, have we proven that these emails and the computer is from Hunter Biden? Yes, I think that's been confirmed. So now the question is, is there corruption evident in the email? Folks on the right say absolutely there is. Folks on the left say it's Russian propaganda. We don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, but to dismiss this out of hand, I think, is irresponsible. And it's also irresponsible of big tech to take a legitimate news story and not allow it to be promulgated uh, through their platforms. That was wrong. And uh, Twitter, Jack Dorsey, even admitted as much. All right. Still to come on Hancock and Kelly, it is time for final thoughts. Best part of the whole show. Let's take you up over the River Road near Grafton, Illinois. This beautiful view captured by our BMW of West St. Louis drone fox.
Got my handy dandy calendar here, fellas. Do you realize we only have, what, two more shows until the election, Michael Kelly? That's crazy. Hey. Right? All these political hey. ads that pay our huge salaries. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, they're going away and people can't get rid of them soon enough. All right, final thoughts time. Michael, you're up first. Well, it started, right? People are putting things on Facebook and social media telling you that the election's been postponed or do this or do that when you go to vote absentee. Here's the key, go to vote. Go to a place that's legally where you're supposed to be able to vote with election authority. Pay no attention to the fake news on social media and any of the distractions that are out there telling you to do this, do that, do the other. The election people will help you vote, people vote, people vote. All right, John Hancock, final thoughts, 30 well, seconds. Well, I'm frustrated with the Cardinals offense this year. The outfield was among the least productive in Major League Baseball. Many games, the three outfielders batted seventh, eighth, and ninth. If only, Brown, if only we had a talented player in our system, somebody who, I don't know, hit seven home runs in the postseason. This is the AL MVP. If only we would have had a guy like Randy or Rosemary. Oh, wait a minute. Brown, well, we let him go. Well, we've let a lot go. All right, hey, we're out of time. We got to wrap it up quick. Thanks for watching Hancock and Kelly, and we will see you back here next.